Hi there. Welcome to this expert interview as part of the MOOC Terrorism and Counterterrorism Comparing Theory and Practice. In this course, we reflect upon the fact that terrorism studies is often very incident driven and that scholars have the tendency to also kind of jump on the latest bandwagon. And this can lead to a situation in which certain topics are understudied. So it is important for progress in the field that scholars also look at topics that are maybe understudied or perhaps adopt a very different angle to a certain issue. So that is why we are very glad to have someone with us today who has reflected extensively on the progress in the field and who also tries to shed light more on these understudied topics. So welcome, Bart Schuurman. Thanks, Janine. So Dr. Bart Schuurman is the head of the Terrorism and Political Violence Research Group at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs of Leiden University. So actually the research group that Edwin and I are also part of. So it's also very nice to have a colleague of ours today here. And Bart, in the beginning of your career, you have done a lot of research into actually why people join terrorist organizations. And you focused a lot on the Dutch Hofstad group, um, a jihadist organization that was also responsible for the murder of the famous filmmaker Theo van Gogh. But after several years, you switched to adopt a somewhat different focus, looking instead at non-involvement. So my first question to you would be, uh, can you actually explain to us why at some point you decided to make the switch and start to focus on this topic of non-involvement? Yeah, happy to. And actually, they are very related. So as you mentioned, I did my PhD on this homegrown jihadist group. I spent a couple of years uh, looking through police material, interviews with them, anything I can get my hands on. And by the end, I knew a lot about most of the people who had been participants. Uh, sometimes I made a joke that I, I felt I knew some of them better than my own friends and family. But what frustrated me was that even though I uh, had so much information on them, and I spent so many years uh, assessing this particular case, I couldn't quite understand why out of this, let's say, several dozen, uh, uh, these several dozen individuals, only one or two or a small handful actually committed or planned to commit a terrorist attack because they all were so similar in their convictions, in their socioeconomic background, in the neighborhoods in which they had grown up together, the friendships they shared. So out of this group of people who had become radicalized, who had become extremists, who very literally were spending time together talking about who they would like to kill or what they would like to bomb, only a very small number actually escalated from those kinds of convictions to doing something in a violent sense. So here I was trying to understand why people become involved in terrorism, and I had hit something of a wall because... Mm -hmm. I had all these fancy theories and insights that worked really well in explaining the small number of people in this group, but also I think we could say in, let's say, terrorism more broadly, mm -hmm. who actually engage in this type of violence. But then there are very, very many people like them who share similar, let's say, risk profiles who then don't end up committing acts of terrorism. Now, of course, this is a good thing for us from a societal perspective, but it's something of a, a puzzle as a researcher. So I kind of flipped this question on its head and, and in my next project, I tried to get some insights into the question of why people who have radicalized and mm -hmm. have adopted these extremists as in pro-violence views don't actually, in most cases, uh, use such violence themselves. Yeah. So what differ differentiates extremists who have become involved in terrorism from those who have not? Okay, great. So if I understand you correctly, you also say this was an example of such an understudied topic, right? So you found a lot of literature on why people join, but you realized, okay, maybe um, there is a real need or, or was there already a big base of academic li literature to, um, to start with then? Not so much. I mean, there's always insights that have been, uh, that you can usefully apply, but I think um, if I can typify, let's say the past couple of decades on research on terrorism, a lot of it's been focused on trying to understand why people who actually became involved in terrorism, why they made those choices. What did their life history look like? What kind of influences were present in their radicalization trajectory that led them ultimately to plan, prepare, or commit these types of attacks? Um, but we have very little research on the question of why people who share these characteristics then don't do something, or at least why they don't become involved in terrorist violence. And when I started this this most recent project, of course, there was some literature out there that asked these questions. Uh, and luckily, I think it's also a growing uh, body of work. I do think there's lots of exciting insights to be expected here. Um, but it was and still is quite a small number uh, of scholars who, who study this particular topic. Okay. And can you explain to us, so you decided I want to focus on this. So 
uh, how did you start then or which steps did you take and how did you actually conduct that research then? Yeah, um, well, let me see if I can summarize that. So the, I think a first important starting point for me always is to not reinvent the wheel. So there's been decades of research on terrorism and political violence more broadly, and other fields like criminology and psychology also have useful insights that can help us understand why people would become involved in dangerous, illegal, and often case, uh, as is often the case, also violent behavior. So my colleague, Sarah Kartha and I, we, we did this project together. We began with an extensive literature review. So what have we got to work with? And then we kind of transferred those insights, uh, operationalized them into a code book that we could use to systematically study both people who'd radicalized and become involved in terrorism, as well as people who'd radicalized, but not taken this final step to conduct terrorist attacks. And so with this code book, we uh, spent a, a couple of years, I think a uh, uh, good two, uh, finding cases, finding controls, and gathering sufficient data on them. And this was a very time-consuming process. It's quite easy, actually, to find information and examples of people who become involved in terrorism because the media is full of uh, news stories about them. Uh, researchers love to write uh, biographies and such. So that went okay. But finding enough controls, people who'd radicalized, mm -hmm. but not engaged in attacks, was more difficult, and finding data on them as well. And that's why that took so long. But it was also rather... Uh, well, challenging, but also rewarding, I would say. Many interesting stories I could tell uh, that we don't have the time for uh, <laughs> now, I think. And once we collected enough data, then we could look at the results to see what kind of separated these two uh, subcategories. Yeah. So maybe to already add to that question, right? So what were some of these main results? And, and uh, we can link, by the way, to all the papers later on for those watching at home who want to know more. Uh, we can share the links uh, in a second, but maybe you can already give us some of the main uh, findings of your research. Sure. So there was, there was, I mean, quite a lot of stuff came out of this. I'll just give you a, a handful of things that I think are most most relevant. So we found, for instance, some um, support for something called uh, a social control theory, uh, the notion that people who have pro-social ties to society are less likely to engage in delinquent, or in this case, violent behavior. So we saw that people who had radicalized and adopted extremist views but still had, let's say, um, a job they were committed to or had important family responsibilities or an education that they were trying to complete that didn't take away the risk they might become involved in terrorism, but it lowered it. Um, as a risk increasing effect, we also saw the influence of, uh, of peers. So if you're surrounded by people who will uh, kind of echo your extremist views back to you or maybe who have um, a, a charismatic ability to um, um, make you go deeper into this extremist worldview and convince you that violence isn't just something legitimate in the abstract, but something that you should do. Well, that's a, a violence uh, increasing, that increases the potential for violence. But actually, one of the most surprising things we found had to do with the, the let's say, the extremist group or movement that people associate with. So on the one hand, we found that if you are a member of, or if you are maybe uh, associated through online channels with something like Al-Qaeda or Islamic State or a really violent neo-Nazi group, then this is a, it has a risk increasing effect. It's more likely that if you radicalize that you will then also uh, conduct uh, terrorist attacks. But we found that many people are uh, who are radicalized are attached to extremist groups that have a slightly more, dare I say, nuanced perspective on violence. That will say, yes, we definitely want violence. We think it's legitimate, but not right now. Now we are too weak. We must first, I don't know, gain recruits, um, get more money, and maybe participate in, in local politics and kind of influence uh, the democratic system from within and ultimately bring about its downfall. And once we've accomplished that, then we will start with our very violent agendas. So long story short, that if people are involved in extremist groups, so who want revolutionary change to violence, but who will see as legitimate and effective more means than violence alone to get there, then this has the effect of reducing the likelihood mm -hmm. that these individuals will engage in attacks themselves. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, so that was one of the, I thought, more interesting or at least uh, yeah. surprising things we found. Do you think there are some policy recommendations? I think, okay, how do we deal with uh, certain groups? And, and we might be uh, afraid and feel like we need to put pressure on those, but you say maybe it's also an option to uh, make sure people can join those type of groups as long as they don't cross into illegal activity, or is that too simplistic of me? Or is there any kind well, of policy recommendation like this you can draw from it? No, you're right. That's exactly what we were thinking of. And, you know, uh, uh, I think Sarah and I would have loved to come up with some very clear policy recommendations related to this kind of group membership thing. Yeah. 
But it's a hard one to make because on the one hand, I do think that if there's an extremist group that people can participate in, and as long as this extremist group recognizes more means than violence alone, yes, it might contribute to a lower likelihood that people in this group will turn to terrorism. But unless this group is is very, let's say, uh, isolated, cut off from society, very marginal, they might represent a bigger risk. They might, for instance, draw more members, uh, contribute to polarization, undermine democratic institutions, and in the long run, do more damage to our societies than, crudely put, uh, a, a terrorist attack or two might. And this isn't something hypothetical. I mean, we've mm-hmm. seen the influence, for instance, of uh, uh, right-wing extremists uh, movements making their way into power in Greece, for example. I think there's very worrying signs of what might happen in the next elections in the US. And closer to home, for instance, in Germany, we also have extremist currents who are able to vie for political power. Um, so, you know, the, 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 I think what these movements all kind of pose as a challenge is, is that they might, uh, that their existence might be some, something of a lightning rod uh, for people not to engage in a political violence. But what kind of damage are they doing in the long run? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a lot more, of course, to discuss on these uh, on these topics. Uh, hopefully, we can also read maybe a bit more in the future about these kind of policy uh, recommendations or the implications it has. Um, but for now, I would like to thank you a lot for sharing your insights with us in this short interview. And as I said, for those of you watching at home, if you want to know more about Dr. Schumann's research, we have added a number of links to his articles. Um, so thanks again, Bart, for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for the invite.